Hello, everyone. Welcome to Let's Talk About Mysteries, Thrillers, and Horror. My name is Renee Edwards, and I'm the Program Director for Fairfax County Public Library. This is one of our many events during Indie Author Day slash Week. And you may be wondering, what exactly are indie authors and why do we celebrate Indie Author Day? An indie author is someone who self-publishes in order to reach as many readers as possible and grow a profitable author publishing business. So our annual Indie Author Day is a very special event for libraries and its readers because it allows us to meet and celebrate the achievements of our local and indie writers. Today, we have a wonderful panel of writers to share their experiences as writers of mysteries, thrillers, and horror. I would like to introduce, and when I call your name, please give a wave. I would like to introduce Henry Britton, Ethan Burroughs, John Molino, Joab Sticklitz, and John Adam Wasseritz. We see you did it great. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Welcome and thank you all for being here. So let's start with our very first question. Really simple one. Who are you? Tell us about yourself. And we'll start with Henry. Thank you, Renee. So good to be with you tonight and with this panel and uh, the guests joining us online. Uh, I am a longtime resident of the DMV, was born in Washington, DC, raised in Maryland and for the past 30 years have lived in Northern Virginia, Lorton, Alexandria, Fairfax, and now the town of Occoquan. I am married to Nancy, who is a healthcare consultant, and we have two children who were raised in this area and are now uh, young adults in uh, Brooklyn, New York, and in Richmond, Virginia. Um, I am a Presbyterian pastor. I have uh, been serving churches here in Northern Virginia since 1989, and uh, my writing includes a variety of spiritual themes. I'm also deeply concerned about the polarization that I see in our uh, society today, political polarization, cultural polarization, and so a lot of my writing explores how we can bring people together to work for the common good. And of course, I'll be talking about uh, my, my books as we go through the, the evening here. But uh, uh, in addition to uh, my uh, most recent works of fiction, uh, I've done a lot of writing on religion and culture for the Washington Post, the New York Times, Huffington Post, and uh, other uh, secular uh, media. And so uh, I have found that uh, this uh, recent turn into the writing of fiction has been really invigorating for me and has given me a, a new outlet to uh, pursue some of the issues and concerns that are very close to my heart. All right, thank you very much. Ethan, tell us a little bit about you. Well, thank you, Renee, and thank you to the Fairfax County Library System. It's such an honor uh, to, to be with you guys tonight and, and our our viewers and participants, um, just extend a warm welcome to you guys. Uh, my name is Ethan Burroughs, and I'm the author of Messianic Reveal. And this one's not out yet, but Writ Reveal, part of the Clayton Haley Reveal series. Uh, these these books all take place in in uh, are set in the Middle East, uh, where I spent a lot of my uh, well, pretty much most of my professional experiences in the Middle East. I'm from a small town in the Appalachian Mountains or the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains of South Carolina. Uh, unlike Henry, I'm a new transplant to the Northern Virginia area. I, I moved to Reston only about a year and a half ago from overseas. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm a U.S. Army veteran. I served uh, uh, well, a number of years ago. Um, I, I, I studied Arabic at the Defense Language Institute <clears throat> and then worked in military intelligence for a number of years. And then once I left the military, I, I essentially picked up and moved to the Middle East where I've been for about 20 years. Um, living in or traveling extensively to uh, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Tunisia, Kuwait, Iraq, Palestinian territories, Israel, and I think I'm forgetting a number of countries. This, this is where it's where my home is, home has been for the last uh, couple decades, where I raised my family. My wife and I have uh, four children, and they've all grown up and 
and uh, you know, in the Middle East, and it's very much part of the fabric of who we are as a family. And um, and uh, the Middle East holds for me a lot of intrigue and mystery, and just just fascination, not only for its its own history, but the impact that history has had on the United States and who we are as a nation. And uh, a lot of and and that's what's reflected in my writing. Uh, you know, over the last twenty years, picking up on some on the, I guess the conflict of, of where faith meets politics has, it's, it's just fascinating to watch and, and see how it unravels. And that's pretty much the premise of my books. They, they're all political thrillers. They're all secular in, in, uh, in nature, but they, uh, I, I say they all, I, I've actually, uh, I'm working on my fourth one. I, I mentioned Messianic Reveal and Writ Reveal. Uh, uh, in the following couple of years, two more will be coming out, but, um, but uh, all of them are, they're, they're thrillers and they're, they're, uh, there's, there's terror, there's hope, there's violence, uh, and there's the real clash of, of where religion and politics get intertwined and you have uh, spoilers who would exploit the faith of the masses for their own political gains. And I find it an absolutely fascinating topic and I'm really excited to be here tonight to talk to you about it. Well, thank you so much, Ethan. And we look forward to hearing a little bit more about your books. All right, so John M., please just tell us who you are. Tell us a little bit about you. Well, hi. <clears throat> thanks, Renee, again, and thanks to the Fairfax County Library System for, uh, for putting this on and for letting us be part of the panel. Uh, my name is John Molino. I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, I spent uh, 20 years in the Army on active duty. Uh, and in 1984, about 10 years before I retired, the Army moved me to Northern Virginia to work in the Pentagon. Uh, and I spent the last half of my career in Washington, D.C., and then retired and stayed here. Uh, after active duty, I, I worked in nonprofit associations, doing advocacy work uh, and working in congressional affairs. I've done some consulting. I had a steady job for 20 years, and after that, I couldn't keep a job more than three or four years. Uh, I've been a Senate staffer. <clears throat> I spent uh, four plus years as a deputy undersecretary of defense after my military service. That was more than a decade ago, though. Uh, I would have to say the most rewarding three uh, employment opportunities I've had is first, of course, my time on active duty in uniform. After that, my time as a deputy undersecretary of defense, because three months after I received my appointment, September 11th, 2001 happened. And that was a very Let's, let's just say it was a very exciting time. Um, and then I spent seven years working at the Wounded Warrior Project. Uh, and that indeed was, uh, was fulfilling and rewarding on a personal and a professional level. Um, my wife and I have been married for 45 years. We have three sons, two of whom are on active duty. One, if you wanna feel old folks, one is about to retire. Um, uh, and Two live in Northern Virginia, and one actually lives uh, in Pinehurst, North Carolina. Uh, and that's me, and I look forward to being part of the panel. You don't look a day over 50. How can you have a child that's getting ready to retire? I don't when understand. I, uh, <laughs> when I worked at Wonder Warrior Project, my boss at the time was 40 years old, uh, and uh, I shaved my beard. And Actually, I'm about five days into regrowing the beard. But I shaved my beard and he said, John, you look so much younger without the beard. You don't look a day over 80. So, <clears throat> Renee, I think the truth meter is going to tip towards false there for you. <laughs> I stick to what I said. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Joab, please tell us a little bit about you. Hey, uh, my name is Joab Stiglitz and I live in Alexandria. I'm originally from New Jersey, but I've lived here for... 30 years. And uh, I have uh, a wonderful family too. There they are. You can't see them because it's reflecting off the screen. Right. But, um, <laughs> oh, never mind. But um, <clears throat> I uh, work in the IT field. I've been everything from help desk to project manager and a few things in between, uh, mostly technical writing. I currently work as a software. Uh, application consultant for a, uh, a company that makes timesheet software. Uh, my writing is all fun, pulp adventure, uh, no hidden meetings or, or statements or anything. It's just uh, entertainment. Thank you. 
And John W., please tell us a little bit about yourself. So Renee, first, thank you for inviting me to this. Uh, thank, thank you to all of the folks who have joined us the evening, this evening. And I hope we have a chance to answer all of your questions about writing um, and to my fellow panelists. I was born and raised in Chicopee, Massachusetts. Went to college as an undergraduate in Vermont. Got a law degree at Marquette University where I met my wife who is from DC. I moved to DC to marry her. Uh, her father said, I don't want my daughter moving to New York where I had a job. So son, if uh, you wanna marry my daughter, you gotta move to DC. And my first job was working for the late great Edward W. Brooke, the first black elected to the US Senate post reconstruction from my home state of Massachusetts. And it introduced me to Washington. And I learned working with uh, Ed Brooke, the value of a law degree. So I went to law school at night in DC, got a degree from Catholic University, got married, bought a home, started a family, and life just kept rolling along. I worked as a prosecutor in Arlington County, Virginia. I left there, I got a graduate degree at the Kennedy School up in Harvard, came back and right now and since 2005, I've been in the federal government I work uh, as an attorney. Um, I do not promote or advertise my, my writing in any way in connection with my uh, job. Uh, uh, I can, I'm still married to my college sweetheart. We have three grown sons, two in California, one in North Carolina. Um, still an attorney in practice and writing wow. books and loving it. Thank you. Wow. So my takeaway, John W. is true love exists. You moved from New York to DC. True love does exist. And um, I think um, everybody who I've been listening to uh, in this uh, uh, gathering in the panel, um, I think you're gonna find that the expressions of the heart resonate in all of their books. And they cer certainly came across in their introductory comments uh, 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 this evening. And that's a great segue to our next question, which is where I invite you to, I know some of you kind of touched on the topics or the themes of your books, but tell us a little bit about your books and why did you decide to write? We have three different genres. We have some of you who are considered mystery writers, writers of thrillers, and then we have one author, I think it's Joab, that's Hara, is that right? Well, I, I will let you tell me. Um, so talk a little bit, why did you pick the genre? And tell us a little bit about your book. So we'll start with Henry. So uh, the first book I wanna talk about tonight is my novel, City of Peace. And uh, I've got the cover right above my shoulder here. Uh, this is a murder mystery set in the town of Occoquan. And over the course of the book, it morphs a little bit into a terrorism thriller. And you may wonder why I would choose that as a platform for dealing with uh, some spiritual and societal themes. Well, I've learned as a pastor that people don't always want to listen to a sermon. In fact, we have a, an expression, don't preach at me. People don't want to be preached at, people don't want to be lectured. And so I have found that by creating this fictional world, uh, a fictional world based in the real town of Occoquan, I've been able to draw people into an exploration of some of the themes that are so important to me, themes of polarization, themes of uh, building a safe and secure community in a time of upheaval, uh, including a terrorism threat. And it really has been, been delightful to uh, enter into this world of fiction and let my imagination run wild. Um, I'm not the first religious leader to do this. Uh, Jewish rabbis have been telling stories for years. Jesus himself was a great storyteller, teaching through parables. And I have found that by telling stories, uh, people get engaged in a way that they wouldn't if I were just lecturing or preaching. 
And so City of Peace, uh, as I said, deals with uh, uh, a crisis here in the town of Occoquan. This is a fascinating town founded in 1734. Uh, it has a, a rich history that uh, could have uh, nonfiction books written about it. Uh, just one little vignette, uh, when um, the country was about to split into uh, two parts uh, right before the beginning of the Civil War, uh, Abraham Lincoln was the Republican candidate for president. Uh, Occoquan, of course, in Prince William County was part of Virginia, which was about to secede from the Union. But Occoquan was an abolitionist stronghold. And so there were many residents here who supported Lincoln and wanted to see the slaves freed. And so in the election of 1860, uh, Abraham Lincoln got only 55 votes from all of Prince William County, and they all came from Occoquan. So this is a town that is not afraid to stand up for what is right and to uh, take some chances in an effort to do the right thing. And that spirit is something that I have continued to explore in the fictional world that I've created with this murder mystery and terrorism thriller. Uh, I'll just mention that uh, my uh, sequel to City of Peace is in final production now. It is uh, another uh, mystery set here in the town of Occoquan. The threat to the town is not a, a terrorism threat. Instead, it is an environmental threat, which is something that river towns like Occoquan are very susceptible to. And so that book will be out, uh, hopefully in time for the holidays. It is called Windows of the Heavens. Oh, wow. What a great point, Henry, to think about, not necessarily, not necessarily preaching at people, but using stories as a way to convey your message. Um, I think people can connect to stories better than if you're standing there on your pulpit preaching hell and brimstone. I think um, stories just really resonate more with people. So that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, I, tr that. I try to create characters that people can relate to. I mm -hmm. don't want any cardboard characters saints and sinners. I want mm -hmm. everyone to, to be three-dimensional so that readers uh, have a connection to them and have some compassion for them, even though someone in a murder mystery is going to end up being the murderer. Because we are not just one dimension. We're good, bad, we're everything. We're human. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for that. Ethan, please tell us a little bit about your books and why did you choose to write the genre that you are known for? Well, I think I'd like to talk more about Henry's books. They sound really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to have to buy them or check them out. Yeah. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Well, well then I'm here to talk about Messianic Reveal. Um, this is, as I mentioned, the, uh, the first so far of four historical political thrillers all set in the Middle East. Um, I actually wrote this book by accident, if that's, if that's possible. I did not set out to write a novel. I'm not a novelist, or I wasn't a novelist. Now I, I'm on my fourth uh, novel. Uh, I actually, uh, I do a lot of writing for my work, um, but I was plagued in my 20 plus years working in the Middle East or working on Middle Eastern issues by a, a series of questions and thoughts and, and things that just really perplexed me. And I started just kind of jotting down a series of questions and then tried to answer them. And in particular, I started thinking about the signature events and dates that have so impacted the Middle East, which have in turn impacted the United States. You know, going back to 1948, the um, establishment of the State of Israel, 1967, six, the Six Day War, 1972, Munich Olympics, 73, Yom Kippur War, up to uh, 1979, the, the Iranian ransacking of our embassy in Tehran, and then the, the rise of the Islamic Republic of Iran, <clears throat> skipping ahead a little bit to 1980, 80 to 88, the Iran-Iraq War, the Iraq invasion of Kuwait in 1990, our expulsion of Iraq in 1991, 9-11, you know, what's that like, uh, 10 years later, our invasion of Iraq in 2003, and so on. And these, these, these dates 
uh, I just find that when I when I studied these and looked at kind of the historical overview, we we tended to gloss over, or or I tended to gloss over, what I think is probably the most signature event that took place in the Middle East that we don't talk about, and that's 1979, the siege of Mecca. And that's where a messianic figure, as in messianic reveal, um, is a cult leader. He was a uh, his name was Muhammad Abdullah Al Qahtani. He and a band of fellow tribesmen and malcontents laid siege to Mecca, the Grand Mosque of Mecca, which is you know, the Vatican of the Muslim world. And you know, there are like one and a half billion adherents to Islam. They all pray five times a day to this holiest site that ironically, and this comes out in multiple uh, books of mine, uh, that this, this site was actually refurbished by the bin Laden family, which is where Osama uh, bin Laden derived or his father derived uh, the family wealth from, from refurbishing the, these holy sites of Islam. But to me, it just baffled me that having been a student of the Middle East, I really didn't know much about this, this signature event that so tra traumatized, certainly Saudi Arabia, but beyond that, the Arab Muslim world and beyond that, the Islamic world writ large. And no one seems to know about it. No one really seemed to talk about it. And I just started, as I started jotting down you know, relevant facts and details, um, questions came to me like, what if, just what if this guy in the picture, I don't know if you can see it on, on the back here, but this, this guy who had honey tinged eyes and a birthmark who on his face and who was able to uh, gain the support of followers and taking over the siege, uh, I mean, siege, uh, laying siege to the, the, the Grand Mosque and holding it for two weeks against the, the Saudi military and police uh, law enforcement establishment to the point where they had to send in Pakistani and French commandos to wrestle them out. And, 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 you know, and, and to this day, people, we, no one knows how many people died in the, the, the battle that ensued um, in which you know, they used grenades and snipers and gas for warfare to uh, you know, wrestle the, 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 the mosque away from these, these you know, I, I don't know, radical cult um, followers, but what if he didn't die? Um, <clears throat> certainly after uh, all the dust settled, the Saudis took out all the survivors and, and beheaded them. And story, it, story's over, you know, there's a huge cover up and it just kind of glossed over. But the questions I started asking, what if he didn't die? And what would that mean? And so the story that, that kind of, started developing and started writing itself is really about how this Muhammad Abdullah Qahtani may have lain in, laid in wait for some 40 years and then resurfaced around you know um, uh, 2019 which is 40 years and 40 years in Islam and Christianity and Judaism is kind of one of the signature time periods a time lapse of 40 years means something and, and they actually have the concept in, in uh, Arabic called Ghaiba which means like a spiritual absence. So what if this guy had been waiting for 40 years to return? What if he had natural ties to the Shia and Sunni and the Arab and Persian communities? Um, what if he had access to one of the co-conspirators, and this is true, uh, the older half-brother of Osama bin Laden was actually part of this cult. And this guy was not one of the people who was decapitated and the guy still lives in, in great wealth in Saudi Arabia to this day. So what if this, this cult leader had access to him and his money? And, and, and the story is also about the faith and how faith and tribalism are motivating political factors um, in, in the region in Saudi Arabia and, and the larger region. And it's also about the extraordinarily ordinary young diplomat who starts asking questions and finds himself in Paris at the US Embassy in Paris issuing visas and he finds a connection between this guy who has this, this name of the, the former cult leader and he comes from the same town where Ayatollah Khomeini had actually uh, taken up residence before his return to um, Iran. And you know, as I started exploring these what if questions in front of me just spilled out a really wonderful narrative, a really wonderful story that I tell you, it, it, it was just so exciting to, to follow. I know I was writing it, but honestly I felt removed and just uh, just watching my fingers right on this very iPad that we're using right now for this virtual conference and, and seeing the story develop. And, and I was very pleased to uh, 
you know, put it in narrative form, put a bow on it and send it off. I'm actually not an indie publish, uh, published author. I sent it off to a, a, a Virginia-based publishing company and, and they liked it. They only published about 13 or 14 fiction a, a year and they liked it and they took a chance on me and I'm really glad to be able to talk about it tonight. Well, it was great to hear your passion. It's really interesting how you stumbled into writing through just asking, what if, and look what it, it sparked. That's incredible. Thank you so much, Ethan. Mm -hmm. All right, John M., uh, tell us about your books. Why did you choose to write in the genre that you've chosen? Sure, sure. Uh, well, I'll start with the most recent book, which is called From a Distance, uh, which is right there. Uh, and um, I, I, I struggle with calling my books thrillers or suspense novels with a supernatural twist. Uh, my wife likes to call them mysteries. I don't think they're much of a mystery because you pretty much know who did it from the beginning. It's the thriller part of it. Um, but um, From a Distance is, is a story of a woman who's coming to grips <clears throat> with an unwanted ability that she finds herself having, and that is remote viewing. <clears throat> and remote viewing is the ability to sense things that are happening that you can't see, you can't hear. They're normally at quite a distance away. Uh, and in fact, I give some background without making it a, a history book, but the United States actually invested a lot of money and a lot of time in remote viewing um, in, in, uh, in the recent past or in the not so recent past. Uh, the Brits did the same thing and the Russians did the same thing. And in fact, there are still people who believe that even though the Americans say we, we don't do this anymore, that all three countries are still investing. They just have hidden it deeper into their budgets. But this young lady has had disturbing images and views in her mind uh, and she seeks professional help. And thanks to her boyfriend ends up with a, a psychologist who is retired from the FBI, thinks she identifies this uh, talent in this woman and refers her to a, uh, a colleague of hers who happens to work for the Defense Intelligence Agency and also the Central Intelligence Agency. And they look into how they can use her ability as a national security asset. Uh, and anything more than that is a spoiler. So I won't go beyond that to say, uh, uh, but that's where it is. Um, my first book was a book called Murder Gets Even. Um, and how did I get into the genre? I, was, I thought we would talk about that a little later, but I can tell you that this one is set in Alexandria in uh, the area known as Cameron Station. Uh, back when Cameron Station was still an active duty military installation towards the end of the Vietnam War era. It is not, you don't have to be a military uh, fan or a fan of military fiction to, to enjoy this book, but it, it's about a self-absorbed middle-aged man who has a, a lust for this young black woman uh, to the point that it endangers his career and actually results in her death. Um, and uh, the, the supernatural element uh, I, I put in the book uh, goes to the point of what crows are capable of. You, you note the birds on the cover. Um, crows are very intelligent. In fact, many scientists would tell you they call them apes with wings. Uh, they're extremely intelligent. They actually can craft and use tools with their beaks. Um, and a group of crows is called a murder. And so it's a play on words that murder gets even. Uh, and it's, it's, it, I actually had a lot of fun writing that because the, the ways in which murder gets back at this, uh, this middle-aged uh, colonel, um, I, I think is very interesting. And anyway, it, that's, that still remains my wife's favorite book of the three. Uh, and I, I, I keep feeling I'm going downhill after that, you know? <laughs> But, um, and uh, Amanda says she's a crow nerd. Super, thanks. Murder gets even. <laughs> and um, my second book was a book called Death in the Dune. And this is an allegory um, about essentially good and evil and the, uh, the need to confront evil. Um, and it, it has, when I wrote the book, I thought my imagery, uh, my Christ imagery and the need to sacrifice and to self-sacrifice was very obvious. People who've read it uh, disagree with me and say, no, that's really hidden. I didn't, I didn't catch on to that. Um, but it, it's allegorical, it teaches a lesson uh, that the need to confront evil and to do so with good. 
Um, it's set in Virginia Beach, Virginia, where my wife and I actually have a condominium. And the inspiration for this book was the dune behind our condominium. Uh, one day I looked out and I saw this hole in the dune that was clearly created by an animal. But I thought, what if, what if evil emanated from that hole in the dune? Uh, and it's not many deaths, it's actual death itself that's in that dune. Uh, again, a fun book to, to write, and I hope a fun book to read. Uh, and I hope people are interested in that. And I'm working on number four, but I think that's a question you intend to ask us later on. So I won't say any more about that. Um, so those are the three books I have uh, out currently. If you have good vision, you can see them over my shoulder in the bookcase, uh, but I'll wave them any, as often as you want. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so you. much. And I, you said something that struck me about uh, with your your books, you know, who done it right at the beginning. We thank you. You know, I love mysteries, but sometimes I just want to know who did it and then I can enjoy the story. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> OK, you don't know, you don't know right up front. Sometimes the crime doesn't happen right up front, but but I appreciate what you're saying. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I want to go to the end of the book just so I can put myself yeah. out of my misery. <laughs> You're not the only one who does that. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Uh, Joab, please tell us a little bit about your books and why you chose horror as a genre. All right. Um, well, my first three books uh, over here, that way, <laughs> The Old Man's Request, The Missing Medium, and The Other Realm, uh, had I written them in the 90s probably would have been one big book, but they're actually uh, related. Uh, the Old Man's Request is uh, the story of a Russian American archeologist in 1929, New York named Anna Rykov. And as a uh, Russian American female professional who could be a Bolshevik, she has trouble finding a job. <clears throat> so when she gets offered a post by a small, at a small college by an aging trustee, she accepts and she meets a doctor and a priest and the three of them become friends. A year later on his deathbed, the old man asks them to do him a favor and address an indiscretion from his youth. <clears throat> and the old man's request is about how they go about doing it. That indiscretion involved summoning something and they have to send it back. Uh, along the way, <clears throat> they learn that the old man spoke with a mystic before he died. Yeah, spoiler, he dies in the first book. <clears throat> spoke with a mystic before he died and had some profound revelation. But when they go to New York City to talk to the mystic, again, this is in the summer of 1929, they find monsters, gangsters, and cultists instead. So it's kind of, it's all action adventure. It's all pulp. Uh, again, there's no hidden meetings or anything, no political statement. It's just fun. <clears throat> Ultimately, they learn where the mystic is, but in order to rescue him, Anna must travel into the realm of the mystic's own imagination, where she finds that she has to rescue both him and herself. And that's uh, the other realm. Uh, those all take place in the summer of 1929. After that, I have another trilogy. These. <clears throat> well, two of the three. Uh, where... Uh, uh, the Hunter in the Shadows takes place in the winter of 1930, so right after the Depression hits. And uh, Anna goes to Boston at the behest of an alien entity to prevent another alien entity from meeting a German archaeologist and causing an apocalypse. Now you might be thinking the apocalypse is World War II, but apparently this apocalypse would be worse than that. So in that book, <clears throat> Anna goes to uh, Boston. Along the way, again, she uh, discovers uh, that realm that she went to in, in the other realm. Uh, she finds herself back there in the world's I, the world's I know, what's that one, where, um, <clears throat> she has become the descendant of the person who caused what's known as the cataclysm there. And she witnesses the results of, uh, of that, which are the consequences of her first visit to that realm. And I just finished the third of that trilogy, 
which doesn't even have a title yet, about a week ago. And I hope to have that one out by the end of the year. Uh, Do you find book, it? I'm sorry. Yeah, the last book, Tales of Gods and Monsters, is just a collection of unrelated short stories. Do you find it hard to remember what you wrote in your first book when you're on book three or book four of a of your series? Like, what did I write? Did you have to go back now and reread your material. Well, like I said, the first three books were kind of all one book or one story uh, cut into three pieces. So I kind of, you know, they're all mixed together. And I, I do use a tool called Scrivener where I keep every keep track of everything and who the characters are and locations and which pieces intersect with each other. It's a very, very useful tool. All right, so, uh, thank you. Yeah. You made me think of Game of Thrones and the writer. Like, how did he keep up with all of those characters and storylines? And because those books were like, yeah, or Dune. Yeah, or Dune. Yeah. Yeah, I went to all see right. Dune in, back in the '80s, and uh, I was there on the premiere night, and they were handing out uh, vocabulary sheets as, <laughs> as if you could read, as if you could read the vocabulary or even connect the words on the page with what they were saying on the screen, but. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> but the fact that you need a vocabulary sheet, that's whoa. <laughs> All right. John W., please tell us a little bit about your books and why you chose your chosen genre. Well, earlier I talked about when I was a prosecutor in Arlington County. We lived in Alexandria down the GW Parkway. And I used to drive up and back to and from work, and I began to fictionalize in my mind, the stories that were in effect the cases I was handling in court. And I cre created a character named Mo Katz, K-A-T-Z, through whom the stories could be told. I found it an extremely effective way to keep track of things and to give meaning to cases that I was handling. So my first book, Dangerfield Island, would, was set uh, along the parkway exactly where I would drive on a daily basis. Like Henry and like John, Henry's story in the Occoquan and John's stories at Virginia Beach and also Alexandria, all four of my books, Dangerfield Island, Jones Point, Slater's Lane, and the new Roaches Run, are places on or around the GW Parkway. Mm -hmm. It's become the spine of my series. And I refer to my books as Old Town Mysteries. The first book is a classic Agatha Christie type mystery where there's a photo in a locket around the victim's neck and the photo unlocks the mystery. In book two, I introduced a new character Sherry Stone, she's an Alexandria detective and she becomes the complement to Mo Katz, sort of the yin to the yang, where they both view things differently, but together they solve the crime. It's, it's the same kind of technique that Conan Doyle used um, and, and that others have used where you have a, a complementary figure to your main protagonist. Then I came out with Slater's Lane, which opens on Easter Sunday in 2020, when a prosecutor opens the door to her home and she's brutally attacked. And it was an investigation that takes place during the pandemic. How do you collect evidence? How do you conduct interviews of witnesses? How is a crime scene explored and how is evidence collected? All of those things I fictionalized and I tried to do in a, in a way that would memorialize COVID-19 and what life has been like in a pandemic. I don't wanna say that I tried to mimic Daniel Defoe writing about um, uh, the Black Death, but I think the book, if it stands the test of time, will be a reminder of that. And then finally in Roach's Run, which is also located on the GW Parkway, 
across from Gravely Point and near Reagan National Airport, I develop a mystery that occurs over the Memorial Day weekend and how a plot to do harm to people ends up being a plot to do harm to the, to the perpetrator of the injustice. So it's been a development that I began as a prosecutor that I've carried through this character, Mo Katz, who as time has evolved, has become more than just a figment of my imagination. I think at times he's a real character and like Samuel Boswell writing about Dr. Johnson, I am simply chronicling the stories of one of my characters. Thank you, Renee. Thank you. So I'm thinking about writing a series and trying to keep track of everything. I guess you wouldn't really have that issue with Mo Katz because each book features a different mystery that they are solving. So, so there are similarities and there are differences. Each of the four books is a self-contained unit. People who read my books ask, should I start at book one? And I say, well, you don't have to. It's like watching a series on television, the third season of Seinfeld. You don't need to have watched the first two seasons. If you like it, you'll go back. If you don't, you'll put it down. But what I have done, Renee, is I've developed my characters. In the first book, I was criticized for not having enough character development. Well, guess what? I didn't know my own characters all that well. Over time, I have gotten to know them and admire them. And I keep their secrets and I hold their confidences. And I try to explore and look at the <clears> world <throat> as they would look at it. I now have an, an entire um, uh, ensemble of characters who revolve around Mo Katz. There, not only is there Sherry Stone, who I referenced a moment ago, there is Mai Lin, who is his researcher, David Reese, who uncovers the first clue in Dangerfield Island and has gone on to earn a law degree and is now himself a prosecutor in the city of Alexandria. I have a uh, private investigator named Curtis Santana who works in private practice with Mo Katz and then accompanies him to the US Attorney's Office and others. So, so the characters have followed and they have grown and there are references in each book to past experiences of the characters to try to explain the motivation for what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, some of you touched on this a little bit, but where do you get your ideas? So we'll start with Henry. Renee, I just want to thank you for assembling this panel. I've just loved listening to what all the authors have been saying, and I'm just making so many connections with everybody. Uh, John, I've got a parishioner who lives on Slater's Lane. I don't think he was murdered during the pandemic. I don't think he's a murderer, but uh, I know exactly where that is. Uh, Ethan, your experience in the Middle East uh, just really speaks to me. That is a huge theme in City of Peace. Uh, and Joab, your uh, archeologist character also touches on a real interest of mine. Uh, and I'll speak just a little bit about the archeological theme that underlies City of Peace. There was a city uh, in the uh, 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 Galilee region of Israel uh, just seven miles from Nazareth, where Jesus grew up. It's now in ruins, and it is the city of Sepphoris. Perhaps if you visited Israel, you've had a chance to tour Sepphoris. It's a fascinating city. Uh, back in the first century, when the Jewish residents of so many cities and towns in Israel were rebelling against the Roman Empire, trying to throw off that oppressive power, the people of Sepphoris took a different route. They made peace with the Romans who were dominating that region. And because of that, their lives were spared and their city was spared. 
And Sepphoris went on to become a center of scholarship and art and commerce. And I'm fascinated by Sepphoris. Um, one of the formative experiences in my life was uh, being able to do an archeological dig in Israel when I was a college student. And although I was not part of the Sepphoris dig, I studied it. And I'm convinced that Sepphoris has something to teach us. We are also in a very polarized time, a, a time of conflict where people are, are at each other's throats, much as the Jews and the Romans were in the first century. And there are ways to find a path to peace. So Sepphoris became an inspiration for my book. And uh, there is uh, a, a storyline within the novel that deals with the uh, main character, Harley Camden, a Methodist minister, reflecting on Sepphoris, uh, reflecting on his own experience there and trying to apply the lessons of that community to his very modern town of Occoquan. Um, I'll get, I'm not going to give away the, uh, the villain who commits the murder, uh, the murder of uh, a young Iraqi <laughs> immigrant in the town of, uh, of Occoquan. I'm not even going to talk about the, uh, the terrorist threat, but I will reveal that uh, the city of Sepphoris uh, was a city that ended up being honored by the Romans, and they minted coins with the name Irenepolis, and that is Greek for city of peace. So that became the inspiration for the title of my book, and it remains a, 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 a community that I think uh, uh, has a lesson to teach us as we try to deal with the conflicts we are facing uh, as a 21st century American society uh, in this, uh, conflict world, the conflict filled world that we live in. You certainly show that, you know, we think the history is past and dead and it'll never happen again. And why can't we move on and <clears throat> this, that and the other, but we are still very much informed by our past. I think um, we can look at the past to see what's kind of happening today. Uh, so that's right. I think, that. I think it was the great writer, William Faulkner, who said, the past isn't dead. It's not even past. Nope, it's not. Just a new reiteration. <laughs> yeah, right, thank these you so are much. the good old days. Yeah, <laughs> good old days. Ethan, please tell us a little bit about where you get your ideas. I know you kind of alluded to it earlier. Well, sure. Um, <clears throat> I Just reflecting on Henry's reflection on Joab, um, yeah, I, I love the connection to archaeology as well, and and uh, I don't know if you can see it. This is my second book. It'll 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 be out for public release in, in April of next year. But you can see the Arabic here. This Arabic is actually taken from a writ from <clears throat> that was found in 1972 in Sena'a, Yemen. Uh, it was found by German archaeologists. Uh, the they were actually doing some uh, well archaeology in in I think the Grand Mosque in Yemen. And some of the custodians there were throwing out some materials, some old scrolls and some papers. And, and they said, wait a second, let's, let's take a look at it. And they found this, this, this Sena, it's called a palimpsest. A palimpsest is a word I, I'd never heard of until I did the research for my first book. And I came across this word palimpsest. And it's basically, it's, it's a repurposed ancient document. It could be papyrus, it could be, you know, something on, on a, like a leather or whatever. So ancient writing that was repurposed. So in this particular case, and of course you can't see it here, you have Arabic of the Quran is written here, but if you look closely, you can see some smudges around it. And so this palimpsest that was the, that that is you know taken from the the, the mosque and from 1972 by these German archaeologists, they they believed that the earlier writing was also the Quran. So so basically, ancient scribes were writing the Quran, you know, very meticulously, uh, and and when they came across material and they kind of rubbed it out so they could write a fresh a version of it. Well, the, the premise of this book is that the German archeologists before they were thrown out of Yemen, they believed, they purported that the earlier Quranic writing predated Muhammad. 
Now, if that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what will, because mm -hmm. in Islam, um, the, the basically the, the faith of Islam starts with the revelation from God to Muhammad. Now, I don't write spiritual books. I write secular books. I write political books. They're historical, political thrillers. But again, one of the themes is that um, is how faith of people is manipulated. So I, 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 when, when I learned of this concept that there could be, there's at least supposition that there are pre-Muhammad Qurans, that blew my mind. And it just helped me kind of come up with the premise. And this goes back to a number of conversations and back to the, Renee, to your question, where do I source my material? Where do I get these ideas? From literally hundreds of conversations with people over dinner, over coffee, in homes, in restaurants, in coffee shops, in shopping malls across the Middle East, getting to know people, hearing their story, hearing their faith or their political views or their cultural uh, ideology or whatever, whatever kind of feeds into, you know, who, who they are as individuals, who they are, you know, what their societies. And I can assure you, I'm not doing an expose on Islam or any religion. I'm simply writing books about the, 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 the clash and the conflicts that arise when faith and politics mix. Um, but that this story in Writ Reveal, just like Messianic Reveal, take, took me way back in time. And it, it started actually back to 1990 and uh, 1991 to uh, Iraqi war dead as the United States pushed the Iraqi forces out of Kuwait. But then it took me even further back to the 1258 destruction of Baghdad by the Mongols. Now, why does this matter? Well, it matters because Baghdad up until 1258 was probably the most important city on the planet. It was the most enlightened and educated. And so when the Mongols came in and within two weeks destroyed the city, it was almost the equivalent of New York and London getting hit by nuclear attacks. That's how devastating it was. And, and, and how, and that impacted that part of the world and, and it had re reverberations, not only of course through that region, but in, even into Europe and even into our own, um, uh, our own, I guess, development of thought many hundreds of years later. You have to read the book to, to get the backstory on that. But to come back to the story, uh, to the question though, where do I get my material? From talking to people. Uh, so many of the dialogues and conversations that take place in my books are just almost verbatim conversations I've had with people. And that's why I wrote them down because they're fascinating. And I, I felt like an obligation, certainly to myself, to my children, to, to, any, to any readers, uh, you know, if anyone would want to learn what's behind the headlines of all the violence you hear about in the Middle East and how that impacts, you know, certainly United States, United States relations with Israel, Arab nations uh, relationship with Israel or any of the other issues that, that float around in the Middle East. And we want to kind of have an understanding of what, again, what's behind the headlines um, that's you read my books. I feel like I am getting this great history lesson from each of you. This is wonderful. Which my husband could join us because he's a history buff. Uh, hey, why is he not? Oh, wait, hey, Renee, why is he not joining us? Come yeah, on. Because right. <laughs> he's worked a hard day and he's relaxing. What Fair can enough. I say? What can Fair I enough. say? <laughs> All right, John M., please tell us where you get your ideas. Well, I'm not so exotic. I get my ideas on Amazon. I just send away, they send me a pack of five. <laughs> I belong in Prime, delivery's free, so it's not much. I used to get my ideas from a boutique store in Tyson's Corner, but it didn't survive the pandemic. Uh, so uh, I, 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 my answer is not gonna be satisfactory to anyone, but an idea comes to mind. Uh, it comes to mind when I'm watching TV, it comes to mind when I'm doing nothing, it comes to mind when I'm taking a shower, it comes to mind at, <clears throat> at the oddest times, at the uh, uncontrollable times. And uh, what I do is I noodle <clears throat> with the idea until I have something I can encapsulate and kind of write down on a piece of paper. Um, and then, you know, the idea might be a scene. It might be a scene that I can, I think, well, I can do something with this. Um, and I, I <clears throat> have taken the heart Harlan Coben's advice. And in fact, Ethan, you mentioned it, and I think you just did it in conversation, but uh, Coben says, he sits there and he says, what if, what if, you know, this happened and that happened? He had one scenario where he says, what if a guy's wife dies and it's eight years later and he's the most unhappy guy in the world and he gets a computer link and he hits the link 
and there's a street cam and there's his wife walking by. She's been dead for eight years. What if, what do you do then, you know? Um, so I, I don't know where the ideas come from. Maybe ideas come to writers and that's why they write, uh, but it, it, they come from almost anywhere. And I think the skill is to capture it and either run with it or, uh, you know, not all of them are good ideas, but uh, those that do lead to, to books go. But uh, I would recommend search Amazon because they do have packs of five that they'll send you. You know, you, you struck a memory in me when I was in high school, I was in creative writing for three years. I fancied myself a little bit of a writer before life hit. And you're so right about when an idea just hits, it hits. I remember mm -hmm. being in the grocery store behind a little baby that, you know, she looked like she was really unhappy. And I was like, I gotta write something down. I was inspired to write just from watching this little baby in the store. And you're so right. Sometimes it is just as simple as that. Something, you see something and it triggers an interest. And I discovered back then that if I didn't write it down right Mm -hmm. At that time, it was lost. So I, yeah. I was known for writing on scraps of paper. <laughs> I, I'm clearly a fan of Harlan Coben's, but he also says that the hardest part is when you're laying on the couch, looking at the ceiling, trying to convince your wife that you really are working. <laughs> yeah, you know? And by the way, George Carlin uh, used to do the same thing with his joke ideas. He would write them down on little scraps of paper and throw them in a shoebox. And his guidance to people was never throw anything away. Uh, and, and the books that he published, uh, Brain Droppings was one of them, were an assembly of those ideas that he had dropped into the shoebox. So you're absolutely right. Toss them in a box, don't throw it away. Yeah, I still have all my stories when I was in high school. I even have the drafts of those stories. Why, I don't know, but yeah, I never throw those away. <laughs> all right, but I digress. It's not about me. It's about you all wonderful writers. All right, Joab, please tell us where <clears throat> you get your ideas. Well, I, I'm a uh, an avid uh, tabletop role-playing gamer and uh, um, <clears throat> game master. So, you know, I wrote scenarios for my games, and uh, during play, I made copious notes. In fact, uh, the notes for this book, for these books, they all came out of this here. You can see it says campaign text, and here are my notes and my maps and all that good stuff. Yeah, that is heavy. And that became my uh, my first three books. Wow. Mm. That's incredible. Thank you so much. All right, and John W., where do you get your ideas? Well, the same place everybody else got them. Uh, I get a lot of my ideas just by living, just by reading the newspaper, watching the news, conversing with people, reading fiction, reading nonfiction. And what I'm, what I'm learning listening to the panel is, you know, your minds are active all the time. You're constantly looking at things. You're you're searching, you're asking, not just what if, but how and why and where and when, and all of that stuff comes together. And you find, you find a thread and you just begin to pull it and it just keeps expanding and expanding. And I guess it's a beautiful way in which life functions. The reason all of us are writing is because we derive pleasure from it. And that pleasure and fulfillment includes the ability to take an idea and run with it and turn it into fiction or fantasy or horror or history. Um, so, so it's a gift that each of us are blessed with. And Renee, don't throw away those, uh, those notes because the day may come when you are the greatest writer of all uh, assembled here uh, this evening. So, so those notes um, may in fact be a treasure trove of great things. Thank you. Thank you. I, on the panel this morning, I told the, the children's writers that I'm going to be the next Stephen King. I've called it. You've heard me today. <laughs> you can say you knew me when. Because <laughs> I like, yeah, I'd, like, That's the <clears throat> I'd like to uh, reiterate what John said, because 
uh, the same advice was given to me uh, by Brian Lumley, the horror author, many years ago. He said, always write all the time, write whenever you can, write whatever it is, just write it down. Thought, idea, it doesn't have to be a sentence or a story or coherent or anything, but just write it down and keep it. Seems to be a common uh, piece of advice. And I see everybody doing the bobblehead know. thing, so yep. you must agree. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much. So it is 731. We are an hour in. I cannot believe how fast the time has gone. I'll ask a few more questions. I would like to stop in about nine minutes and we'll open it up to our attendees to ask um, any of our panelists questions for them to answer. So one more question I would like to ask from this list of questions that I'm looking at. Let's talk about something that's not even about books specifically, the books that you're writing. Uh, let's talk about things that you have learned from creating your books. What are some pearls of wisdom that you can share about the book writing process in your experience? So uh, Henry, we'll pass it over to you. Well, I think one of the things I've learned is once I really let my imagination go, and create characters and have them start interacting with each other, talking to each other, uh, engaging each other, they take on a life of their own. And that kind of surprised me because I'm a person who likes to plan things. And I had a pretty good idea of what the narrative arc of my book was supposed to look like. But once I started creating these characters, they started going in directions I didn't expect them to go. And I just had to let them do that because unless they had their own integrity, unless they could really interact with each other, the, the book was gonna come out sounding very forced and artificial. So uh, I found uh, to my surprise that my best writing came from just letting my characters go. Thank you. Huh. Let them tell the story. Exactly. Wonderful. Thank you. Ethan, what's the one, so what's some surprising things that you've learned being a writer, creating your books? Um, yeah, something similar. Um, <clears throat> I started by trying to build out complex outlines, like, uh, you know, kind of setting out plot lines. Uh, I give that up very quickly because um, just as Henry said, um, sometimes the, the story just writes itself. The characters develop in front of you and, and you just need to kind of hang on and, and just you know, make sure you're typing fast enough for the story to catch up. Um, uh, and, and, uh, but, and then kind of separate to that, um, the, I think the surprising thing for me is the reaction of readers. Um, I, I think I've stumbled on, on, on a story that's never been told. And that's what I get really excited about with my books because I wanna see where they're going. I, I really get invested as a reader, even though I'm the writer, um, but just seeing the impact, because these are, I, these books are, you know, you take them on a beach trip, you put your feet up and you read the book, you're done with it, right? That's the way I've always seen a novel. But, but uh, I, I find when I, like I gave a copy to my neighbor recently and she came back to me with a stunned look on her face. She said, um, it took me a while to read your book because I, I was taking copious notes. And I said, why are you taking notes? It's a fiction. Why are you, why, why, you just want to read it and move on, go to the next one. She said, no, there, there are things in it that I'd never heard before. I, no one's ever written anything like this. And, and the same thing, I had uh, someone who, who read it and said, like, I had to keep, I had to keep stopping the reading because I had to Google and fact check you. Why are you fact checking me? This is fiction. Why are you <laughs> fact checking a fiction? Um, I mean, there's a lot of truth in it. There's a lot of perception in it, but it, at the end of the day, it's meant to be entertaining and fun. And frankly, a little bit informing. Um, a lot of this derives from, uh, you know, some of the thought process and the premises derived from a lot of dinner conversations I've had with people who have very strong but uninformed opinions about, about the Middle East. And uh, so, so I, I guess you can, to, to keep it short, what I find surprising is just how people are impacted by the story. And, and it just kind of sparks me to want to write more. Right, thank you. Sorry, my laptop battery's dying. All right, and we're back in yeah, business. Yeah. 
All right. All right. Thank you so much, John M. So what's one of the most surprising things you've learned in creating your books? Well, I'll, I'll be very succinct. I, I can tell you, I, I agree. I, I was once laughed at in a writing group when I said the characters actually take over. <clears throat> and I feel like I'm observing what they're doing and just writing it down. And some fellow in the group laughed at me. So I quit the writing group. Uh, <laughs> was, I'll give you, I'll give you a three surprises and five pieces of unsolicited advice. Um, it was harder than I thought writing. It takes effort. Uh, it's rewarding, but it takes effort. Um, I found that I was surprised by the importance of having a writing discipline, having a routine. Uh, and the third surprise I had was the, the vital importance of having a good editor. Um, I, I've read some people who have self-published and their editing is awful. Uh, and they didn't invest in a good editor and it really suffers. A good story goes down the drain for that reason. Um, pieces of advice, unsolicited advice for me to people who want to write. I say write every day. Uh, as much time as you can commit, the four hours is the max for me. I'm drained at the end of four hours, but some people can go all day. Uh, but I think writing every day is important, uh, especially if you consider it a vocation and not a hobby. Uh, write wherever it works. For some people, you need to be alone with the door closed. Some people can write in a Starbucks because the white noise in the background uh, helps them kind of zone everything else out. Where Whatever works for you, do it. Um, third piece of advice, decide if you're going to do this as a hobby or as a vocation. And I don't mean a vocation like you have to feed your family on it, but you make a commitment to it as a job. Uh, and that means you, you, uh, you dedicate more time to it and uh, you're less likely to get this uh, amorphous writer's block, which I don't believe in. Um, anyway, uh, and then uh, don't be discouraged, except that every first draft stinks. Uh, but you know, you have a first draft and you make it better and then you make it better and you make it better. You have a blank piece of paper, you can't make that better. It's as blank as it's ever gonna be. So get your first draft on paper and then make it better. Uh, and then my last piece of advice is get a good editor. Uh, who, who uh, and learn to take that criticism because it's very worthwhile. How's that? Thank you. And I have a question for, about editors, but I, I will save that for the Q and A portion. All right. So, Joe, please tell us about one surprising thing you learned as a writer. Well, uh, I don't think it's contradictory, but I found that I need an outline. You know, for all of my all of my books, started out with uh, you know a 10 chapter outline. Yeah. And I think my shortest book is 28 chapters because some of the chapters become multiple chapters, some of them disappear altogether. But you need some structure or it's just going to go wherever it will. Uh, these books are actually my second attempt at writing. I started writing a Tolkien esque journey novel back in the 90s. And I wrote a chunk of it all at once. And then bits of it, you know, when the muse hit me over the next couple of years, then there was a gap, and then I wrote a bunch more, et cetera. And uh, I ended up with 300 pages of story that was not coherent. The plot <laughs> changed, the genre changed, the characters changed, and, you know, I threw it away. Well, I set it aside here somewhere. And um, <clears throat> I sat down. 10 point outline. I wrote The Old Man's Request in about nine months from start to publish. And then The Missing Medium, about the same. The other realm took a little bit longer because that was tying up the trilogy. And, uh, you know, as John said, you write on a regular basis or set a goal. I try to write a chapter a week, and I define a chapter as about 1,600 words. Usually when I'm writing, I write a couple chapters at a time, but I can't, I can't do it for more than maybe two or three hours. After that, I am just exhausted. Mm -hmm. You know, in some weeks I don't write anything. Some weeks I, I finished the book. You know, I finished number six two weeks ago after uh, I started that one before the pandemic started and, you know, COVID kind of just took my steam and then I started it up again at I think the beginning of October and said I'm just going to finish it I want it out by the end of the year 
I have bought, I paid for the cover two years ago. I've been looking at it. <laughs> It's my screensaver. I've been looking, or my uh, backdrop. I've been looking at it for two years and saying, I got to finish this book. I've also got the cover for the next book, which hasn't been written yet. That's good motivation. <laughs> for sure. All right. Thank you. And John W. So I'm not going to talk so much about writing, uh, but what I've learned from marketing and cool. two things. Uh, one is, the incredible people that I've met. I never anticipated when I was writing these books that I would be signing them and giving them to all of the remarkable people who have bought them. And Renee, when we started the program, I was talking to you about somebody from the Library of Congress. I just use that as an example. It's remarkable how many connections you find with people and how much they give back to you as a writer. Or writing is a solitary thing. You do it by yourself, sitting down in front of your iPad or your computer in front of a screen and a keyboard. But then there comes a moment when you're promoting that book. So that's been a great reveal and a great, wonderful um, aspect of it. The, the second part of that is the marketing. And uh, I take my hat off to every entrepreneur and everybody who works retail. I mean, it's a tough, it's tough. And you are constantly trying to find venues and angles and opportunities. And through that, I've acquired an appreciation for every, everybody who runs their own business, for everybody who tries to promote their own product, whatever it may be. So those are two of the unexpected gifts that I've been uh, able to um, acquire um, as a writer. Thank you very much. All right, so I'm gonna ask our last question. A very important question, I think. How can people buy your books? So Henry. Yes, uh, so, um, the, the on various online marketplaces are uh, an easy place to, to find my book, uh, amazon.com, barnesandnoble.com. If uh, readers want to support their local independent bookstores, which I um, feel very strongly about, they can order City of Peace through an online service called indiebound.org. And the book will be delivered to your independent bookstore. So um, there are a number of stores throughout the DC area that are part of the Indie Bound network. And um, you can order the book online and have it delivered uh, to the people you want to actually buy it from. So uh, uh, IndieBound.org is a great uh, source for a lot of good titles. Thank you for that. I did not know about that company. Thank you. Ethan, how can people buy your books? Well, uh, the same, Amazon.com, Books a Million, uh, Barnes & Noble, all of the big distributors have a uh, Messianic reveal. They do not have writ reveal yet. This doesn't come out until April, but Messianic reveal, of course, is, uh, is available. Uh, a couple of the small bookstores, I actually moved here under COVID, so I haven't been able to connect with all of the bookstores, all of the independent ones in the region. But uh, I know that um, this this will soon be at Bard's Alley. It's uh, at Politics and Prose now. And um, and you can find four copies at Joy Unlimited in downtown Fairfax. And if you go there, you have to see the proprietor, Lynn, and check out her 1965 Mustang that's just out parked out back. It's fabulous. It's worth the trip just to go see the Mustang. Uh, but, uh, but I have some copies of Messianic Reveal there at her little corner books, bookstop, uh, bookshop. But, but yeah, uh, but people can order it off online on um, you know, Amazon and all the big distributors. All right. Thank you, Ethan. John, how can people buy your books? John M. Uh, yeah. Uh, my books are available at Amazon.com. Seriously, this time. Not the idea store, but the, the, <laughs> the books. And it's as, uh, as, as print books or as uh, Kindle books. Um, right. Thank you. All right. Oh, by the way, <laughs> let me also mention that yeah. 
if you don't want to buy it, but you do want to read it, the Fairfax County Library has been kind enough to shelve all three of my books. Yay, I was going to put a plug in for the library. Yeah. Thank you, John. <laughs> all right, Joab. All right, well, my books are all available at all the uh, online folks as well, uh, as well as on my, uh, my site, joabstiglitzbooks.com. Uh, uh, the first three books, uh, Old Man's Request, Missing Medium, and The Other Realm are also available on Audible. And all the books are available as paperback or ebooks. All right, thank you. And John W. Yeah, so thank you, for, thank you for letting us promote our books uh, during this program. Um, you know, the, the best place is, is Amazon.com. You can put in Mo Cats. You can put in Dangerfield Island, Jones Point, Slater's Lane, or Roaches Run, and my books will all pop up. Amazon does a great job of putting the books together for you so you can buy them as a package. And then there is a company called Made in Alex, A-L-X, Made in Alex. They have a pop-up store this month and next month through the holiday season on Wales Alley, W-A-L-E-S, Wales Alley. It's in the foot of Old Town. And my books are there. And you can pick up a copy. And if any of the folks who are listening in on this program would like to get a copy, let Maiden Alex know that you'd like a signed copy. I would be honored to sign any of my books for any of you with a personal inscription of our having met one another tonight on this Fairfax County Public Libraries program. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, John. That's wonderful, thank you. All right, so we have about 13 minutes. Um, before we open it up to our audience, I wanna take a look at, look at the chat. Um, Stephen, thank you so much for all of the wonderful comments you've put into chat, very informative. Um, we do have one question from um, one of our attendees asking about, has anyone on the panel thought about using one of the ancient civilizations as a backdrop for your novel? And I know some of you have chimed in and answered her, but can you speak to that because yes, we are recording this? That, that was my question, Kama. Yes, yes Ms. Murti, yes, thank you. Yeah, so, uh... As I said in my presentation, <clears throat> the uh, first century Galilean city of Sepphoris is the backdrop for my novel, City of Peace. And in the sequel uh, uh, to that book, uh, the uh, Mayan city of Copan from the golden age of Mayan civilization forms a backdrop for uh, windows of the heavens. And I have found the, the research I've done uh, into the archaeology of both those sites has really uh, deepened and enriched the stories I'm trying to tell. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Ethan. Uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> I, in fact, I answered uh, in the chat box. Uh, but yeah, I, uh, I talk a little bit about medieval Baghdad in my second book. In the third book, which is called Babylon Reveal, I actually go back, the backdrop to the, the, the book is the ancient city of Babylon. And I'm really excited about that because um, uh, one is, uh, you know, the third book, I kind of know what I'm doing now. I have a story, I have a mold, I'm using the same protagonist. And I think uh, it was one of the Johns mentioned earlier, you know, I didn't really develop the character in the first book, but by the third book, I get to know the guy a lot better. I like him, he's, he's, he's uh, I'm more comfortable, all right, I'm more comfortable in his skin. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but but I know the protagonist and and I, I take him back to ancient Babylon and I'm really excited about it because I got to ask a question. Again, it's a political historical thriller, but I get to ask the question, why does God hate the city of Babylon so much? It's like the most cursed city on the planet. And I get to ask the question, why? And in order to do that, I actually have to go back to Babylon and I do it through multiple, uh, all three Abrahamic faith uh, scriptures and lore and eschatology and prophecy. And I tell you what, it's just fascinating. It's, uh, you know, I, I get to be in the driver's seat in a, in, in a time mobile. And I, I think it's really cool. 
Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to answer Ms. Murti's question? Um, I did mention that that I made biblical references, uh, stories and personalities that, uh, of course, are, are ancient uh, Israel, basically. Um, just one comment about Henry's uh, interest in Sepphoris. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, Sepphoris is within walking distance of Nazareth, where Jesus grew up. And it's thought that that as a young man, he would have, with his father, helped rebuild Sepphoris after a Galilean revol uh, revolt against the Romans. Uh, the, the other thing that, that ties him to Jesus is the word hypocrite uh, in Greek um, means actor. And <clears throat> Sepphoris had a Greek theater. And so a young Jesus would have known what a hypocrite was um, because of that theater. But Jesus reimagined that word in a way that we use it today. And, um, and so um, Sepphoris is, is a very interesting ancient city. Thank I'm you so, very much, Stephen. I'm so glad you brought that out, Stephen. And uh, in, in spite of everything you've said about the uh, connections that Jesus probably had with Sepphoris, the city is never mentioned in the Gospels. It remains a kind of secret city. Well, it, it is mentioned. It's just not mentioned directly. Uh, whenever you see a New Testament reference to a city on a hill, Sepphoris overlooked Gal Galilee, and it overlooked Nazareth. So when Jesus would look up, he would see Sepphoris. Um, and, and so a city on a hill, uh, that's the reference. All right. Well, thank you very much. We'll see if anyone else in our audience has questions for our, our writers. I have a, a answer for that question. Oh, sure. Yeah, uh, my my stories obviously are fiction based on uh, my my uh, gaming experiences. But if I share my screen here, I can't share my screen. I have two books, uh, the worlds I know. If you really can't see from that picture, is based on uh, ancient Egypt, and the uh, the new book has um, Mayan uh, aspects to it. Of course, the Mayan aspects are inhabited by crocodile people in Egypt, <laughs> in Egypt or insect men, but that's, uh, that's, that's just uh, my way of doing it. All right, thank you. So I don't have an answer to Amanda's question, but I do just wanted to say, Amanda, at first, I thought you were in like a lotus position and were just immobilized for about 10 minutes. And eventually it occurred to me that I was looking at a photo. There you are. Okay. Amanda, can you unmute yourself and state what you wrote in chat, please? Thank you. Yeah, I can also kind of read and maybe better explain what I'm asking. I'm asking this question because as a genre writer myself, um, people make a lot of assumptions about what I'm writing based off of the genre that it fits in, right? And so a lot of the times I have to kind of push back and say like, oh, this isn't just for one type of reader or one demographic. And just because it has this title on it doesn't mean that you're gonna find like this element in it. So because we have three genres represented here, I was sort of wondering if there's myths of these genres that these authors have sort of had to kind of come up against and maybe have to explain like like you're saying like oh oh you write a horror novel so it must be really bloody right well well not necessarily maybe you write psychological horror or horror can mean a lot of things not just gore right so I guess I'm just sort of wondering if there's any of those typical tropes or assumptions that these writers have had to kind of like fight against okay I, I, can, uh, I can speak to that. Um, my books are pulp adventure. I call them supernatural pulp adventure. The, the technical genre name is cosmic horror. Cosmic horror as opposed to gothic horror. You know, gothic horror is man versus God. Cosmic horror says humanity is insignificant in the universe. And there are entities out there that uh, inadvertently impact you know, life on Earth often unknowingly or by accident. 
and uh, the horror part of it is that their motivations, etc., are unknown to us, and the revelation of their very existence and such is is, is horrific. These these stories in the golden age were uh, characterized by having the last sentence in italics, and his feet were not there. You know, something like that. <laughs> but uh, no, it's not horror. People today think horror. They think you know Friday the Thirteenth. They think Pulp Fiction, unfortunately, they think of that movie. You know, Pulp Fiction was based on um, essentially the isolated Americans getting exposure to the rest of the world. As people were becoming more literate and, and travel and such became more um, prevalent, people started thinking about the rest of the world. Of course, people writing about the other parts of the world were usually living in some basement apartment in New York City. But, you know, <laughs> they had more uh, more uh, insight than the people reading them. So uh, Pulp Adventure, Cosmic Horror has nothing to do with Pulp Fiction or Friday the 13th. Uh, I could say a word or two about that as well, yes. because in, in, in Murder Gets Even, when I say the setting, and it's a little bit... Uh, off what you're asking, Amanda, but when I say the setting is Cameron Station, when it, when it was still an active duty uh, military installation, people will say, oh, I, I don't like military stories or I don't like army stories. And I even, I fell into the trap even in my introduction of saying, you don't have to be a fan of it. It has, it has nothing to do with the military, except that's the setting uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for the story. But it is not a war story. It is not a, you know, people crawling from ditch to ditch kind of story and all that. And the fact that I'm retired army even adds to that. People say, oh, it must be. No, it really isn't. Uh, and then in, in Death in the Dune, uh, people have told me I will never be able to look at a dune again uh, with any confidence because this book scared me to death. Uh, I don't pitch it as horror. There are some really scary parts in this thing. Uh, if you consider that somebody is engaging a hole in a dune uh, and inside that dune is death itself and evil um, not the most comforting thing in the world but I, tr I tried to avoid saying it's it's horror or it's scary because I really want people to read it because I think there's a deeper story it is it is really in my opinion an allegory there's a lesson to be learned here um, so the short answer to your question Amanda is yes I think uh, very often you get pigeonholed and people say, oh, I don't read that stuff. It's just like saying, I don't read Stephen King because I don't like horror. Well, if you read 10 Stephen King novels, you realize this guy's a lot better than the movies make him out to be. Thank you. Anyone else like to answer Amanda's question? Yes, Ethan. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. It's, um, I think people are looking for convenient little boxes to put your, your, box, your book in and, and it doesn't work because they haven't read it. So, uh, you know, and I describe mine as political historical fiction, and that's trying to get across. It's not a book about comparative religion. Yes, I discuss religion in my book, but it's not comparative religion. So, you know, some people want to put me in the category of, oh, this is like a Tom Clancy government thriller because you talk about, you know, Department of Defense, Department of State, the CIA. Uh, yes, but it's not like that. It's, so others will say, oh, no, you write like Dan Brown, because instead of using symbology, you use uh, like iconography. Like, yeah, a little bit, but it's not that either. It's not Clive Cussler. It's not Joel Rosenberg. It's not any of those guys. It's Ethan Burroughs. And there's no real convenient label uh, to have. And I think, you know, the, the answer to your question is, you know, you write for yourself and you own it. And and try to kind of build the bridge to the to the readers across the multiple labels that they want or the multiple boxes they want to put you in. Uh, <clears throat> just to add on that, the, the one thing that I think all writers really hate is when people ask, what's it like? You know. What's it, it like? Is I'm sorry. It is eight o'clock. I do want to be respectful of people's time. Um, just really briefly, um, Ethan, there was a question um, from someone in chat. Was the Islamic professor in your book based on a real person? Um, 
uh, the most of the characters, including this particular pref, uh, professor that I guess I have a reader out there. This is wonderful. But I believe this is referring to uh, Dr. Ibrahim Mustafa, who, um, who is a composite of multiple people I've met. In fact, many of the characters in my books, uh, especially people I'm trying to venerate and honor and memorialize, um, are, mul are uh, yeah, they're composites of multiple, you know, very smart, passionate people people who took the time out of their lives to explain to me their culture, their, their society, their faith, their political influences, and to help me understand. They bridged to me, to, you know, a guy out of, you know, the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, you know, transplanted to the Middle East. So, so yeah, I'd say, I think that this is talking about one particular character. And I would say, yeah, he's a composite of multiple characters. And as I mentioned earlier, most of the dialogue in the books really come from my own experience and expertise in conver and, and conversations that I've had with folks there. So yeah, I'd say that that's based on multiple real people. Thank you all. This has been such a riveting discussion. It has been a joy to sit here and listen to the history lessons and your experience as writers and your books. Um, thank everyone who attended. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, Indie Author Week is not done. We have more author events. So tomorrow at noon, we have Let's Talk About Biographies and Memoirs. I'm putting the program link in chat. If you click on that link, the Zoom link to that presentation is in the event description. I snuck it in there. Don't tell anyone. Um, so I hope to see some of you tomorrow at noon for Let's talk about biographies and memoirs. Writers, dear, dear authors, thank you so much for being a part of tonight's event. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Real thank pleasure. You. You're so welcome. You're Have wonderful. a wonderful evening. Thank you, you Renee. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Renee. Bye-bye.